Hello friends, welcome to Game It Up. My name is Dave and this is a review of Euphoria The Saga 2. A review code was very kindly provided, so thank you very much to the publisher, and a big thank you for coming to visit us. If you're new, then you're very welcome to join the party by hitting that subscribe button, we'd love to have you on board. So, what is Euphoria The Saga 2? Funnily enough, it's a follow-up to Euphoria The Saga, which was an NES game made by Sunsoft back in 1991. My first exposure to this series was when that NES game arrived on the Wii Virtual Console and I was greeted by a very cute and fun Metroidvania style game. Although it's not a game that came to mind all that often in the years since, I was pleasantly surprised to see a new game was announced. So what did I think of this one? Let's start at the beginning. I'm not really sure how you pronounce the main character's name, is it Heeb or Hebby or something like that? Anyway, I assumed he was a duck at first, even though he can't swim, so I might be wrong there. He wakes up in his house in the tree, where he has a toilet out in the open for all to see. Interesting choice. He comes across an alien who has crash landed. The alien calls him Penguin Boy. So, is he a penguin? That makes no sense, penguins can swim. But I don't think this game tries to make sense really, so fair play to it. The alien has spread a gooey substance called Bumyun. The sense of humour in this game is really good. So you're tasked with ridding the world of this sticky nuisance and taking out the alien threat. The structure of this game is similar to the original, but also a departure. You still have the four playable characters that you unlock one at a time, each with their own abilities which allow you to access new areas. So far, so Metroidvania. But the way the world is structured is different. You have the central hub world where he lives, and you can leave at different sides of the screen to access other areas. There's caves to the right and fields to the left, or there's a tree you can eventually climb up in the top right and so on. But when you enter an area, the layout of the area itself changes each time and it's randomly generated. Don't worry, because although it has Metroidvania elements, it doesn't mean you'll get lost in an ever-changing maze, as each area is linear and you always end up in the same place. It's just the layout of the platforms and enemies that will be different. The four characters you have are Heeb, who has no special abilities to start with, although later on he learns to climb walls, Ochan, who can swim very well and walk on ice, Sukazamon, who I hope I pronounced right, has a floaty jump to get across large gaps, and finally Jennifer, who can dive and swim underwater. The general gameplay loop will involve you exploring an area you can access, collecting coins and these Utsu cans. When you reach the end of a level, you have a boss fight. The three extra characters you unlock have to be fought first, as they've been possessed by the Bumyun. After that, you can either fly back to the hub area with this bird, or carry on to the next area if there is another area beyond. The controls are pretty simple, just use the stick or d-pad to move, B to jump, when in the air the trigger or down will do a butt bounce. Pressing Y brings out your popoon. In the original these were projectiles you found around the map or dropped from defeated enemies, but here it's something you can pull out at any time to use as an attack, although you will have to wait for it to recharge each time. This will stun enemies, but it's useful for removing any bumyun in your way or on an enemy. Collecting coins and Utsu cans are an essential part of the game as any upgrades you get need to be bought by a vending machine at your house. The house where Heeb has his bed and toilet right out in the open. Sorry, I'm really weirded out by him having it there where everyone can just see him doing his business and uh... Oh, never mind. He just uses it to wash his face. Uh, I don't know if that's better or worse. Some of the items in the vending machines won't become available until you collect enough of those Atsu cans, so that becomes my main task. A lot of my time was spent basically playing through each stage, farming coins and finding these cans. There is a finite number of cans in each area, some are easy to spot, Others require an upgrade, such as activating the spring platforms. As I was playing, I did notice things that bugged me, such as, why can't I crouch? Why is there no map? Or even a checklist? Well, the game did answer my questions gradually, as all these things that I was wanting became available in the vending machine. 
Unfortunately, the map, which has a checklist of how many cans in each area, is only displayed at your house and can't be brought up anywhere. I understand an exact layout of each area isn't possible as it keeps changing, but knowing how many cans are left in an area at any time would have been nice. When you enter an area, you will have free hit points, but this can be upgraded from the vending machine. There is a nice variety of enemies you might recognise from the original, and are generally defeated with a butt bounce on the head, or throwing your papoon first if they have bumium on them. This game is making me say some really strange things. The most memorable enemy to me is this bird whose attack is... yeah. You know it's weird that they just go anywhere like that when there is a perfectly good toilet out in the open on that tree. In fact, you'd do more damage to Heave by using that because he washes his face in it. Each boss follows the same general formula. You throw your popoon at it and then bonk them on the head a few times. But they do change things up with this same formula due to their movements and stage layouts being different each time. So overall, the gameplay is nice and simplistic. It can get quite addicting to replay areas with a different layout each time to try and collect more coins. The game even gives you mini challenges, such as getting through an area with no damage or in a time limit to earn more coins. And you can buy access to challenge moons to gamble for more coins or even to win Utsu cans. One thing that did get a bit irksome was sometimes I would buy an item only to realise it wasn't essential to finishing the game, but I had no way of knowing. Like, I would buy a gramophone that lets your characters sing at any time, but the singing didn't do anything to help you progress anywhere, so that money was better spent elsewhere. And it became a problem towards the end where I spent over an hour and a half farming for coins, because I was stuck and had no idea how to retrieve the final items I needed. So I was trying to build up enough coins to buy everything, because something must be the right thing. Then I realised I didn't need to. It was my own fault as the information wasn't concealed from me of what I needed to do, I just didn't notice it. I beat this game in just under five and a half hours, but had I not made that mistake, then it looks like I'd have done it in four. Obviously, if you want to 100% this game, then you'd have plenty more time with it as I still had much more to save up for. But when you know which items are essential and which aren't, it's a quicker experience such as the fact that you can buy these special moves for each of your characters that do some more powerful attacks, but none of them were essential to getting past anything or defeating any enemies, so you could just ignore them. Although farming for coins did get a bit tedious, on the plus side, it meant I could spend longer in this game's world, and what an amazing world it is to be in. It goes for an arts and crafts aesthetic and it really looks wonderful. The characters have a felt-like quality to them, and it's a bright and colourful world. It puts me in mind of some of Goodfeel's efforts. The music, I hope you've been enjoying throughout the video, is very catchy and really suits the gameplay, although I found the theme that plays during the dialogue scenes was kind of irritating, and it just stuck in my head for ages. <laughs> But that didn't stop me enjoying these scenes, as the charming look and feel of the game is greatly complemented by the humour and likeability of the characters. This is a great bunch of characters who bounce off each other nicely, and I'd like to see an animated show with them. The game costs £22.49 with a 10% pre-order discount. This is another game where I didn't look at the price before I had finished it, and I had somewhere in the teens as my thoughts on what the price would be, so I was kind of surprised to see it in the 20s. It was a five and a half hour experience for me, and as I mentioned, it could have been four hours if I'd paid more attention. Although I did find the gameplay loop to be addicting, at trying to farm for coins and collect all the cans in order to buy all the upgrades and extras, it did feel a bit tedious to go for 100% and there wasn't much of a challenge to the game at all. For younger players or those looking for a relaxing experience, you will no doubt have a really nice time with this, and the look and feel of the game as well as the charm of the characters is certainly a huge positive here. If you like a challenge, you won't find it here, but if you want a relaxed, simple, short experience in a very charming crafted world, then you could do a lot worse. So that's what I thought of the game. How about you? Does this look like something you'd be interested in? What other crafty aesthetic games are your favourites? I was a big fan of Yoshi's Willy World myself. Let me know in those comments down below and make sure you like and subscribe for more to come in the future. Thank you so much for watching everyone, see you in the next one.